and Keenan, don't get us preaching too soon. But the five-year-old voice is leading a lot of people. Wow. <laughs> the glazes, come on. We've got Grant and Alexis glaze. Some of our limitations are learned. A limitation is learned, but I think a limitation can also be heard. So many times when I'm counseling people, so many times when I'm walking somebody through something, if I can make them track back far enough, it often not only goes to how they were treated, it goes to how they were spoken to. I think we have to be like a TSA agent. Nothing's getting on that plane that isn't, that isn't sub subject to the authority of Jesus. Mm -hmm. if, if it does not pass the authority check of Jesus, and I cannot say it's true of me in Christ, then it cannot live rent free in my head. <laughs> our words and our excuses also shape our perspective of God. Because yeah. I think when we begin to live inside of our excuses as to why we can't be free, yeah. as to why things will never change, as to why we are the way we are, we are also saying that that excuse is more powerful than Jesus. Woo! Growing Gen Z teenagers to the point where when it's time for them to get in the game and not just sit in a seat and take notes, but it's time for them to lead, what does that look like? Man, bro. <laughs> That's a that is a loaded question. Hey, welcome back to the No Counterfeit Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Keenan Clark. Today I'm joined with everybody's favorite, Beth Clark. And I'm really excited because we are in Livingston, Texas at the shooting of this. And the reason we are here is because we are at one of the coolest places in the world to us, one of the coolest youth ministries on in all of Texas, but not honestly just Texas, honestly, all of the United States, we've got some of the greatest youth pastors in the world. You met one of them. Now you're going to meet both of them. Today, we have the Glazes. Come on. We've got Grant and Alexis Glaze. We also are joined by a very excited but meager studio audience. <laughs> so we are very excited. They look beautiful. Welcome to the podcast, my friends. Thanks for having us, guys. Oh, we're pumped. Thanks for being in Livingston. Absolutely. And coming and hanging out for a few days and being incredible people. Well, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. You guys are some of our favorite people in all the world. I've said it on a previous podcast that was not technically a no counterfeit podcast. So I'll say it again. You guys are for real, in our opinion, the best youth pastors in America. I, for real, I, we have the privilege of traveling all over the United States and we've met a lot of amazing people. We, lead, we meet a lot of anointed people leading a lot of great moves of God pound for pound you guys i like using that language i like that pound for pound it just sounds tough that's tough twin <laughs> tough twin i like that pound for pound you guys have the strongest most potent vibiest and an most anointed i almost said an i almost said anointedest it's not a word most anointed youth ministry we've ever had the privilege of stepping foot in. And so we are excited to be here. Right now we're on set at The Offering, which is the spring break camp. Um, the branding for this place is sick. It, it's been incredible. God has been moving wildly. Uh, teenagers are getting set free. We busted out the oil last night. We were laying hands on people. Uh, it was truly incredible. And God's just been doing more and more each night. We're very excited. But we're, one of the things we were just kind of talking about right before we started this podcast was something that God has placed on your heart, which I honestly think is just right in line with the heart of this podcast. And it's that you can't stay stuck. And I think so many young people, especially young people, young adults feel stuck with the personality type that they have, the friend groups they have, the rejection they've experienced. And then that begin to think that that's all that lies ahead of them. So Grant, like you, you were kind of sharing me the, with me that you've got some stuff like this on your heart. Can you just begin to unpack that a little bit and we'll just go where the Lord leads. Let's go wherever the spirit follows. Come on. Where, wherever the spirit follows. Who's the spirit follow? Okay. I, I don't want the spirit to follow go. me. I want to follow we're the spirit. We're already starting off heretical. I love it. I love it. I love um, it. No, gosh. <laughs> Be my theology check, I got please. You. I've got you. Um, no, I, it actually, it's all, all this started. She was watching our last podcast in the living room. She's watching it. And I'm sitting there going, man, I sound weird. First off, it's a kind of weird thing of listening to yourself back. But uh, yeah. as, a, as a preacher, you're trying to like, especially early on, early on, listen to yourself and try to make adjustments. So I've listened to my voice, but it wasn't that. It was more of, I just was like, you sound like nervous. You sound like I, all that type of stuff. And she's, she literally goes to me, she goes, Hey, were you really nervous at the beginning of this I podcast? actually think I said, why are you so stressed? Something like that. He was no very way. stressed. 
I I felt it from his voice. Yeah. Okay. And immediately this this thought literally jumped into my into my into my like being mind everything. And it's something that I feel like I've I've struggled with at different seasons of my life, but it was the thought of like, oh, you're right. I do I do sound like that. <laughs> That is what I sound like. like and, Eeyore. and immediately, kind of Eeyore, yeah, yeah. Eeyore. almost like a little like Aww. I'm not saying you're a five year old, but in that five year old voice, like you're right. And and Keaton, don't get us preaching too soon. Oh. But the five year old voice is leading a lot of people. Wow. <laughs> the five year old five year old the five year old wounds, the five year old hurts, the five year old traumas, the five year old bondages are leading a lot of people. But um yeah, it was like that little kid so in me. True. It was like and honestly, just from an honest perspective, as someone that is your friend, but also looks up to you um, in in a healthy way, it's like there was this thing of yeah, that's kind of Keenan's deal. It's just not I, I, that's not really my thing. I, I won't be ever. I won't really ever be good at that, like Keenan is. You know what I'm saying? And I think a lot of us get stuck in those types of perspectives of well, you know, that's just God asked me to do certain things, and God has put a uh, call in my life to do certain things. But I don't do it as good as so and so does those certain things, yeah. and so I'm I'm just always going to be like that. I'm never yeah. going to do it as good as they do, and I guess I'm just going to have to manage with my capabilities as they are, and accept them, and accept my limitations, and move on with my limitations, and just kind of struggle through life with the, these limitations for forever because that's just who I am. Yeah, mm-hmm. and. uh and the reality is that is not the truth. <laughs> that no. is a counterfeit, as, yeah. as this podcast is is named after. It's a counterfeit. And uh, what the Holy Spirit convicted me of is you can accept that limitation. Mm-hmm. You can live in that limitation. You can stay stuck in that limitation. You can pout about that limitation. You can whine about that limitation. You can have that little five-year-old spirit about that limitation. Or you can receive my invitation to get up and try again. Wow. Get come up on. and step out again. Get up and have faith again. And so I come on the No Counterfeit podcast today, not sounding stressed out, not sounding tired. Come I'm on, come on. You sound so, so confident. <laughs> um, but yeah, and and as you go throughout scripture, we won't get too into it yet if we get into it a little bit more later. But I was preaching the next week on the story of Matthew, the tax collector following Jesus. And just the it's all throughout scripture. It happens when Jesus heals people, it happens when he asks people to follow him. But there's this little there's this little word that is the word arise or arose or got up. Wow. And it's like this reality that like you can rise up from the place that you've been at for a while. Even yeah. if you're a mafia member t- collecting taxes, yes. you don't have to stay a mafia member collecting taxes. You can rise up and you can follow Jesus into what he has for you. And I think that's the premise of the framework that even what I wanted to share with our young adults here of a lot of times as a, as a young adult, you start getting in that weird phase of where you're solidifying, where you feel like you're solidifying parts of your identity and you feel like I'm just always going to be this way or I'm stuck here. The reality is you are not stuck anywhere because in the minute you yeah. get, the minute you believe you're stuck somewhere, you create almost like a stronghold uh, uh, where the Lord can't lead you out of a place. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And the Lord wants to be able to lead you into new things and lead you into new places. So you're not stuck. You can just get up. Come on. So good. I thank you. Like, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> yes. the hand clap. Like, yeah, it was so good. I think like one of the things, and babe, I'd love for you to chime in where you are ready to speak to, because I know this is something you can speak to. I've heard you for the last four years speak to these things in me. Um, the limitations that we put on versus accepting the invitation to step out of those limitations. I mean, we kind of talked about it yesterday, but the the seventh hand of God only shows up when you're at the end of your six hands. Now, I, pre- I preached a whole sermon on this. You can go check it out. It's called uh, You Need the Hand of God. I think it's on YouTube. But that seventh hand of God doesn't show up until you are literally out of your depth. I am reaching as far as I can reach. My grip can no- go only this far. But what God's calling me to is here. In that gap is the invitation to trust God beyond your limitation. And I know like, oh, we're getting preachy with it. Like we're rhyming and stuff. So it must be true. It is true. Even if we did it in such a way, it didn't rhyme. Um, And I think that's been the thing over the last four years of our marriage, the last four years of our ministry has really been embracing that place of like, God, I'm going to go where my limitations aren't going to be the like safety net. I'm going to go to where it's like, if you don't show up, I'm going to look ridiculous. Like if you don't show up, 
people might even say like, Kenan doesn't know how to hear from God. Kenan said God was going to do this and God did not do that. Now all of a sudden my integrity's on the line. And sometimes you have to choose to like follow the Lord at the risk of your integrity, quote unquote, being compromised because you're sure that he's calling you out into that place. And so I think a lot of young adults specifically, and I know there are many people who listen to this podcast who you would not call yourself a young adult, but some of the things you're struggling with, you picked up as a young adult, you've been struggling with since you were a young adult, and it's about time it was broken off of your life. You don't have to live this way any longer. Um, But I would say there are, some of our limitations are learned. They are not legitimate. They are not legitimate limitations. They are learned. And some of it is something we go like, oh, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to stay humble. It, it, it is not humble to submit yourself to a limitation you don't actually have. I kind of, have you, did you ever see The Incredibles? Oh yeah. Baby. I loved The Incredibles growing up. Dash, he is like constantly having to hold back because I, I can't I can't stand out that much or somebody might, you know, want to dissect me in a lab or like I can't really be everything that I'm called to be. Those limitations are learned. You're not living up to like, and I don't even love like the word potential just because I think culture has hijacked it and sometimes you can get so reliant on your potential that you quit relying on the Lord. But the Lord is the one who gave you capacity. The Lord is the one who gave you the potential that you have. And I think so many limitations are learned. And it's time we just get up accept the invitation of the Lord. And babe, I'd love if you'd kind of like share a little bit of that. Cause like, I feel like you help people demolish that stuff all the time. I, um, I think your thing about being known, yeah. like go into that a little bit. That's so good. Well, I have this other thought and I'll try to connect them. And if okay. I botch if, it's it, fine you, you don't. can bring it back around, whatever. <laughs> That's great. Um, But I feel like you can be held back by your past in two different ways. I feel like you can be held back by who you used to be and that you haven't healed past it or you feel like, you know, it keeps coming up or the enemy's throwing it in your face or even people in your life are still holding you to a different version of yourself of like that old man is actually dead and a new man is here now. But I also think you can be held back back by your past in another way and that is Well, I used to be even worse. I used to be even worse, so I guess it's okay where I am now. Girl came to cook. (laughs) And I think that, like, we need to allow people to to speak into that. If you are known by people that can legitimately speak in authority, in rightful authority of your life, they know you. Mm -hmm. They know what you've struggled with. They know what you've laid down. They know what... What's habitual in your life, whether that's habitual sin or habitual lies that you're struggling with and they get to like breathe into it and speak into it and breathe life over you. Um, Then when an enemy comes creeping and crawling, you have the people that have that authority in your life speaking into it. And I feel like that's just a really good way to combat the enemy is is being known and being in the light. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Because the enemy wants you isolated and that's your big thing in that that yeah. I've heard you like counsel so many people in is the quickest way to get over the lies of the enemy is to be known by people who love you. Yeah. Because they can speak to those places and the enemy, if he gets you all alone, his voice is the only voice you're going to listen to. Yeah, he to. gets to run the narrative. That's what you always say. He gets to run the narrative and you've got to get to a place where somebody else can hijack the narrative of the enemy and give you the true narrative of the Lord and say, hey, here's what is actually at play here. Maybe this is a limitation. I'm not trying to say every limitation you have is made up in your head. Some of them are, but maybe some of them are legitimate. And the quickest way over them is to get on your knees, as 1 Peter 5, 6 says, to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that in due season, he would lift you up and acknowledging them, but acknowledging uh, the hand of God is above it all. It's above my limitations. Uh, Alexis, go for yeah, it. Yeah, no, I think that there's a flip side to that too, right? Because 
the same way you would allow somebody in to speak that limitation off of you. You said a limitation is learned, but I think a limitation can also be heard. Yeah. Wow. Like somebody can speak limitations over you as well. Yes. I just think so many times when I'm counseling people, so many times when I'm walking somebody through something, if I can make them track back far enough, it often not only goes to how they were treated, it goes to how they were spoken to. Uh, even sometimes when they weren't spoken to with a negative intention, even a parent saying something like, you're never going to be good at singing or mm -hmm. you're never going to be good at school. It's yeah. just not your thing. Yeah. Right. And something that was just no parent you would hope would set out to be like, and I'm going to cripple my child now for the rest <laughs> of their life. Right? right. But something that was was just said in flippancy can become a limitation that then tracks with you for the rest of your life. So the same way you would invite people in to speak those limitations off of you, I think it's also important to look around and exercise wisdom into who am I allowing to speak limitations onto me. Uh -huh. uh, yep. So when you evaluate whose voices you're listening to, you're not only looking for the voices that are bringing freedom, but you're looking to eradicate the voices that are bringing the bondage as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, that's really important. Oh man, so powerful. I think sometimes people of faith, if, if somebody who looks at a, who's not a person of faith, looks at a person of faith, like a person who speaks in faith, which is what we're all called to be. I understand that there is a word of faith and I hate to even use that language because I honor so many people who would be classified as word of faith preachers, but there is a counterfeit mm -hmm. word of faith when it, your faith is in the fact that you confessed you had faith rather than in Jesus, right? Oh, well, I held too, true to my confession. What was your confession? I'm not sick. Well, why won't you be sick? Because I confessed I wasn't sick. That has nothing to do with the Lord. Is You're just like putting good vibes out there. That's like borderline new ageism, which is demonic, okay? But some, one of the things that I have seen as time has gone on has been this thing of your, wor your words become your reality. Yeah. The words that you identify with, they become your reality. Um, and sometimes people who aren't people of faith can look at people of faith and be like, you're actually lying. I'm not lying. I'm choosing to agree with God. Mm. Lie, like be, Being a person of faith isn't saying, I don't recognize this is where I'm at. Yeah. I'm just choosing to look beyond it, right? Um, I'll never forget a story of a great man in my life. His name was John T. Holler. And um, I'm actually named after him to a degree. Anyone who's ever been to Christ for the Nations knows who John Holler is. Um, but there was a story about when he was pastoring this little church in West Texas. He went up to this man and he stuck his finger in his chest and he said, you are a loyal, faithful man. You're a loyal, faithful man. And in that moment, if you were to look at that man's life, he looked nothing like a loyal, faithful man. But something about John Holler coming up and sticking his finger in his face and saying, you are a loyal, faithful man. Not, I believe one day you'll be a loyal, faithful man. He said, when he looked at me and I, be I believed he believed that mm -hmm. about me, something about that moment broke infidelity off of me. It broke doubt off of me. And he became what John Holler came and shoved his finger in his chest and decreed over him. There's something powerful about that. And sometimes you've got to borrow someone else's belief. That man borrowed the belief of John Holler. He had no belief in himself. So I'm going to borrow the belief of somebody else in me until I can get my own belief in what yeah. God's doing in me. Does it make sense? So kind of get going all over the place here, but Grant, like this was originally your thought. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm just thinking as everybody's talking, the thing that I keep thinking back to is the reality that if we are not careful, first off, that we have to be like TSA agents with the stories that we believe and the words that people speak to us and the thoughts that we think. And because because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if faith yes. comes by hearing, then the the antithesis of faith is also going to come through our hearing and the thoughts wow. and the story that we're believing about ourselves. It's true. So I think we have to be like a TSA agent. Nothing's getting on that plane. That isn't that isn't sub subject to the authority of Jesus. Mm -hmm. If if it does not pass the authority check of Jesus, and I cannot say it's true of me in Christ, then it cannot live rent free in my head. Yes, you know and 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 also being careful about when people say things to us 
Uh, I know like in my life, I've had people say things to me and I didn't accept it or reject it, Mm -hmm. rebuke it. I just kind of let it be in an apathetic way and treat it casually. And you never know, the Lord has gone back and shown me afterwards, like a year later, that something that I just thought was casual actually impacted me at a deep level and it changed how I was obeying Jesus. Wow. Right? So it's like the words that we believe, the stories we listen to matter so much. And then to be careful, because if we aren't the TSA agent, and this can happen in different areas of our life, but if we aren't the TSA agent with the thoughts or the stories we believe, then we will start, what we consume, we will then create. And so we'll consume a narrative about ourselves, and then we'll create a story that we tell everyone else that sets up for us a protection around us so that if somebody does come in and try to say, that's not who you are Mm -hmm. and that's not what you should be doing, we say, but look at all of this around me that proves that that's who I am and this is what I should be doing. And it's these excuse networks that we build up so that we always have a reason for why we are the way we are and we can't actually be set free from it because now we are stuck. Yeah. Right? So... I just think, I don't know where we go off of that, but I think even just speaking to that for a second, I, I just feel like I was supposed to lay out that framework of just like the excuses that we build off of these stories to protect ourselves when somebody comes in and tries to set us free. That is so true. Um, this is the definition of propaganda. Propaganda is where the government tells you something is true so many times or an authority figure tells you something is true so many times you no longer question it, even though you have no evidence for it. Like you have no evidence for the fact that like what they're saying is true, but you've been conditioned, right? I guess like Mm -hmm. another term would be brainwashed. Like you've been brainwashed um, into believing these things about yourself. And one of the things like my dad has said, and I just thought this was so good. He said, your excuses will quickly become your excuses in the kingdom of God. Wow. Your excuses. Come on, Brandon. Will, yeah, come on, Brandon Clark. <laughs> Read your white boy. He says, your excuses will quickly become your excuses. Before you know it, God wanted to use you, and it's an excuse. That's King Saul. Exactly. Yes. Go into that. <laughs> I was like, I was <laughs> hoping you'd go. I was hoping well, you'd I mean, take that. That's literally like, it's it's excuses and stubbornness, right? It's it's He he comes up for with a reason, an excuse for why he disobeyed the Lord. Yeah. And then he and then when the Lord comes to him and gives him an opportunity, gives him an invitation to get up and to be honest and to repent, his heart is not to repent. His heart is which may be the root of all of this self-preservation everything. His heart is to be glorified. Mm-hmm. It's all a self-serving, self-seeking, selfish thing. And and maybe one of the greatest things we can do is is get our eyes off of ourselves. But yeah, so King Saul is he he makes these excuses and then he gets replaced. Uh-huh. And it's just like uh, one of our favorite stories lately, which maybe you want to get more into because you just preached about it. But I'm thinking of like this the story with Elijah and mm-hmm. how God gives him opportunities. We've turned that story into a story of like being suicidal. Mm-hmm. And we've turned that story into like a mental health story. And that story is God coming to him saying, get up, get up, get up. I'm not in these things that shake you and break you. Get up, get up. And then he ends up getting replaced because he will not get up. Yeah, yeah. so good. Do you want to talk to No, that? I think like, yes. And, and I think like when the Lord comes to Elijah at the end of what we see as Elijah's story, he confronts Elijah. He speaks to him in the still small voice. He tells Elijah, basically, this entire time you thought it was just you. Your complaint against me this entire time was that you're the only one left. And what you didn't know was I've preserved for myself this army of people who have not bowed Let's go. down right to Baal. And he was like, so now what I need you to do is go back down the mountain and anoint your replacement. And he sends Elijah back Elisha. down to anoint this Elisha. This is 1 Kings 19. Yeah. And, and, and the reality replaced. is like... So good. It, and, and our words shape our perspective, not only of our own situations, but our, our words and our excuses also shape our perspective of God. Because I think when we begin to live inside of our excuses as to why we can't be free, as to why things will never change, as to why we are the way we are, we are also saying that that excuse is more powerful than Jesus. And and the crazy thing about that, just to really pull it back to scripture, the craziest thing to me about that, I'm going to go Bible nerd here for a second. Nerd out on us. In John, right? 
It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And it talks about how Jesus was the Word made flesh. So the power that's in the name of Jesus is all wrapped into yes. the fact that Jesus is the Word. Yes. yes. And so when we use a word of confession over our own lives, again, I don't say that in a sense of like, not to harp on our word of faith, friends. Again, I don't use that in a sense no, of like, no, yeah. watch your confession. It's all about your confession. But when we put, when we pin our confession yes. of truth against the other word yes. of Jesus, yes. it's like word against word. Yeah. And and then we'll stand there and we will allow our word to be the victor over the word. And, and when you words. think about it like that, nobody would own up to that, right? Like, oh, I would never. Like, I would never take my word and put it against Jesus and give myself the victory but our excuses and the world the worlds that we build because of those excuses are are pinning our words up against the word of Jesus wow. and we are claiming the victory over what he's done wow and over what he said one well, how man you uh, that's why I like getting around people who know the bible <laughs> how many christians is elijah in that moment a picture of Sin, you're like, God, I'm the only one. Yeah. God's like, little do you know, if you'd ever come out of your freaking cave, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you would see I have a remnant who are listening to me. And now because you believed you're having to do this all by yourself, it's now time. You've waited so long in a sense. Yeah. It's time to find your replacement. And you know like, the craziest thing? Dang. Is you know how you know Elijah was blinded? When Elijah comes, I think in chapter 18, face to face with Obadiah. Remember, and Obadiah is like, you've, you're my death sentence now. Obadiah tells Elijah, you've heard what I've done. I've hidden a hundred prophets of the Lord in the caves. Mm. But Elijah already in that moment was so, he had already decided that he was alone. He did not even hear somebody face to face telling him there's a hundred other people somewhere. Like had Elijah not already been convinced that it was only him, that God had abandoned Stop. him, you know? Yeah. He would have heard, there's a hundred more. Where's the hundred? Yeah. Like, let me go find the hundred and be with the hundred, yeah. right? It's just the craziest and thing. And he's stuck in his story, right? Because yeah. he yeah. says, it's literally like word for word. He says the same thing, mm -hmm. right? That same that same uh, reason to God for what's going on. Like, he has that same excuse, that same, which is, I think, interesting. And like one of the ways that I've talked about it before in a message is like, you know that you're stuck in your own story when the same story is getting repeated no matter what god does no matter what no, no matter what conversation you have you have with somebody over coffee and how much they encourage you no matter what sermon you hear no matter what worship song you listen to no matter how much you, it's like the same story keeps coming out and that means you're not you at that point you're not making the choice to get out, to accept the invitation to get up and there is so a good. choice element to it. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Key. It's a choice. There is a choice element. Deuteronomy 30, 19. You know, I've laid before you life, death, blessing, curses. I, and I call on all of heaven to witness the choice you will make. People want to act like, and again, we, I love people of varying, you know, theological persuasions, but people who want to act like literally everything that I do is God's fault, it's all predestined, then why does Deuteronomy seem to say that God has given us a choice? Yeah, it's good. I, I, I call on all of heaven to witness the choice you will make. Not yeah. the choice I secretly predestined and now you have no choice to play out, but we're going to call it your choice. Huh? God's not playing that game. Like that's a weird theological game good friends of mine play and I'm begging them to stop, but we've got to, yeah, we got to quit that. And isolation is a breeding ground for spiritual insanity. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, he says, go and sin no more. He wouldn't give us a command that he doesn't know that we can accomplish. Right. A hundred percent. One of the, that, that's so good. Woman caught in adultery. I think that's John eight. Um, one of the things you were saying about Saul reminds me of the day the kingdom is literally torn from Saul. Um, and the reason it's torn and it's using that language is because Saul tears the garment of Samuel, right? God had given Saul a clear instructions. You go and you wipe the Amalekites off the earth. You don't leave anything. You kill women, men, babies, goats, pillage the town. And Saul goes in and he kills everything but the stuff he liked. Yeah. He killed everything but the shiny stuff, even including to the degree that he left the king alive, right? The king of the Amalekites. And Samuel comes in and he's like, yo, why? I hear the bleeding of sheep 
in my ears. Amalekite sheep, what's this about? I thought God told you to kill everything. And literally Saul's response is, well, I was holding on to those to sacrifice yeah. them to the Lord. And it's like, I don't care what you want to do for God if what you want to do is disobedient That's to what so he good. asked you to do. That's true. Like, oh, what I want to do this for God. I, I want to win my boyfriend to the Lord, but he told you to break up with him. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Like, but I want to win him to God. But he said it's like over. A good thing. Huh. But he says it's high over. In here. Bring in the high school. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I just think like there are places where like our that's an excuse. Yeah. The excuse thing. But I wanted to sacrifice it to God. But that's not what God asked you to do. Your ideas are not better than God's. That's like so good. I felt like God will get more glory out of it this way. Oh, you know how to give God more glory than he knows how to bring to himself. Mm. Interesting. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, that's tough twin right there. Come on, somebody. Here's a place I would really love to go because right now, all of you can't see it, but we have, like I said, a meager but enthusiastic meager studio wall. Meager sounds all. horrible. Meager? I'm meager in number. Yes. Meager in yeah, number. Yeah, yeah. Meager in number. number. Forget numerics. Number. Numerics here. But they are very, No, I'm not talking are, about stature. Their bodies are very strong. Very strong. They're very healthy. They are not emaciated. They have... <laughs> That's what I we are feeding them at this Some camp, I promise. Some of them have been fed. Some of them maybe have Some of not. them have chose to fast, Okay through disobedience. I'm just joking. So one of the places I want to go is because I am literally, I, I, I feel I'm looking at the fruit of your ministry, your high school ministry, because these are young adults who no doubt, I'm sure many of you have come up under the leadership of Life High. And now you are still here serving, giving, being involved in some capacity. You have transcended this, well, I'm just a student I'm not, you're, you've transcended being a consumer and you're now being a contributor in a season where it'd be okay if you were, if everyone was like, yeah, they're done. Like they're done with this thing. I want you to talk to that growing Gen Z teenagers to the point where when it's time for them to get in the game and not just sit in a seat and take notes, but it's time for them to lead. What does that look like? Man, bro, <laughs> that's a, that is a loaded question. First off, I'll say this. And, and sorry, podcast for a second. One of the things in my notes for this session was just to say how proud I am of you guys for how you've led this week, for the ways you've led, Amen. for uh, for the ways that you have even just prayed for students and been there. I think you guys have done an exceptional job, like a crazy good job. So that's the first give yourselves a hand. Come on, give, give yourselves a hand. Be proud of oh, yourselves. <laughs> like that was so weak. That like, you could call meager. We, we're not ready. To, <laughs> yeah. like, we're not meager. ready to be proud of ourselves. Yet. We just want to nap. Um, I feel you. Um, the the next thing I would say to that question is because I think I don't say this as a deflection. I say this is a genuine, genuine, super genuine point. Is that it would be impossible without thirty nine years of legacy that our church has developed in Next Gen Ministry and all of the different people that have poured into, in specific, like everyone sitting here, the 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 church that has poured into them. Yeah. Um, because I don't think it is genuinely, I'm not a false humility thing, genuinely. I don't think it's just a, a thing that we have done that has done that. The thing that I will speak to that I think that we have done, that the Lord showed me last night and that he showed me this summer that I do think that we have done well, is that I think that, we have given the Holy Spirit room to move and given the Holy Spirit space to move in students' lives. And I think that is probably the most significant thing we've done. Wow. I think it's the most significant thing we've done because I think it gives, I think we don't have to, I don't feel like we have to have a ton of like leadership classes on how to, how to handle the ministry moments in the room. I feel like we've, people have experienced the Holy Spirit. And so now they're Amen. letting other students experience the Holy Spirit. So, um, and on that side, I would just say it's so, I think it's so important as a believer, not just as a ministry leader, if you are a ministry leader watching this, it, I think this is a vastly important, but even if you are just a person following Jesus, it, there has got to be space in life where there is no programming, there is no agenda. There is no nothing except for space 
for God to move. And that's it. That's so good. And because it's in that space where um, I'll get a little preachy for a second. Preach. But, and it's, this has been on my mind a lot lately. I've been talking about it a lot lately. So bear with me, everybody that's in the room. But for all the new listeners out there, <laughs> do that. Be that guy. For all of our new listeners. Um, <laughs> on a, no I love it. Like, um, but thinking along these, this reality that we are to be washed with the water of the word. Ephesians talks about that in Ephesians 5. Mm-hmm. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved, loved the church. Lay down your life for your wife as Christ laid down his life for the church. And then it speaks about being washed over by the water of the wor- word and being sanctified, right? Being set apart. And we're all of us are Christ's bride, and we all have to have space to be washed. Yeah. And those who are pure are blessed because they see God. Mm-hmm. And Jesus was effective because he saw what the Father was doing and did yes. it. So if we're going to do anything of effectiveness in ministry or even other people in our ministries are going to do something of effectiveness, they have to see God. Yeah. The only way they can see God is to be pure in heart. The only way you can be pure in heart is to be washed by God, by the water of his word. And so the water of the word, the washing happens when the word of God yeah. meets the water of God, which we could get into the whole, we could go, oh, we could go Genesis. Yeah. One, all the way to Jesus showing up on the scene at the baptism, yeah. all the way up. Spirit hovering and, over the waters. Oh my goodness. We could yeah. walk through the prophecies. We could walk through, walk through the Old Testament and I could show you the significance of the Spirit of God in water. Mm. And the reality is, is that the Spirit of God is, is used, water is used for a metaphor all throughout Scripture. And the water is the Spirit. And when the water washes with the Word, what happens is Ephesians 6 the word now becomes a sword that's a weapon. Wow. And so now I don't need a lot of ministry classes on how to fight spiritual battles because I met with the spirit. The spirit caused the word to come alive. And now when I'm in moments, when I'm in situations, when I'm needing to, when I'm needing to have faith or needing to do ministry, what comes out of me is the weapon that the Lord gave me and the space that I had for him lingering in his presence. Come on, baby. Um, and, and so I think that I genuinely think our ministry has changed mostly in the last two and a half years because I finally put my foot down and I said, I think we're supposed to do linger and we are going to make space for linger no matter how inconvenient it is or no matter how much I feel like it's awkward when only one student stays, we're going to do it. And so at the end of every single service, other than once a month to give our worship team a breath of oxygen um, other than once a month at the end of service, we stay most nights until the last person leaves or until we feel like the Holy Spirit's wrapped up. And sometimes it's, it's service ends at eight. Sometimes it's 1030 at night yeah. before there's been once or twice where it's been like 1030 at night before we left. Um, and it's inconvenient, but I believe that that's the space where the, where the Lord can do something in their life that I can't do. And I think when the Lord does something in their life, then they show up to serve those that are under them, not what I tell Amen. them, hey, come and serve. So good. So hopefully that answered the question. Oh, absolutely. You've got a lot of insight. Yeah, no, sure. I would just say the people in this room, these like young adults that are here serving at the capacity they're serving are not doing that because of us. They're doing it despite us. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and that's not like a, a false humility thing either. But when you look at deconstruction, mm-hmm. when you look at church hurt, when you look at their generation as a whole and the struggles that they're facing with the church. Um, One thing I'm grateful for is that, well, first of all, I'm grateful to serve alongside of somebody who has so much humility uh, and who always owns up to, we should have and could have done this better. Uh, But I'm also, we have the privilege of working with a group that we are very transparent with and they have a lot of grace in our transparency. Mm -hmm. So we have never tried with them to create this false sense of we know what we're doing and just do what we're doing because this is what we're going to do, right? We do ministry with them. Amen. uh, And we're very open and honest with them. Like they're, they're at our house and they're eating dinner with us and they're hanging out with us on a Wednesday night or a Friday night in our home with our two crazy little kids. Like they see our real lives. Yes. And we can own up to the things we don't do well or the things we don't do perfectly and we can talk through those things with them uh and so i think them having grace for our humanity and just 
being like they love Jesus and they're doing their best the way we love Jesus and we're doing our best, I think is why we get to serve together. And it's so fun to serve together and so enjoyable to serve together because we do it together. It's not like Grant and I and then, okay, you know, our young adults, you guys do some ministry that's the stuff like we don't want to do or, you know, some weird dynamic like that. It's we all have a heart because God has called the church to equip all of the saints for their ministries. Mm -hmm. And we're all being equipped and we're all working together to equip the people that we serve. Uh, And I think that that's like a massive part of of why we're living in the grace that we're living in. So good. I will say one more thing about it because I'm as I'm looking out. uh, Well, first off, she's completely right. Some of it is at because I mean I I say it all the time. I'm like I I say it straight up on Wednesday nights for the pulpit. I'm like y'all think I I don't know what I'm doing here. Like doing linger, I'll be like. I don't know. I'm just, I don't know why we're, I don't know what we're doing. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I just know that God had told us to linger, so we're lingering. I don't know what else is happening. Um, that's really so good. So, that is true. I don't really know what I'm doing a lot of times, but, um, <laughs> follow the Lord. Um, I know what the Lord's doing. Um, <laughs> anyways, um, I could go on and on. I love it. But <laughs> the, the reality is, is that like one thing that I do think that we have done well is, I think that we have created space in the best way possible. Obviously, you can't do this perfectly, but I do think we've created space to allow students to make life high theirs. Yeah. And um, like I said, we haven't done it perfectly at all. I'm I'm very OCD when it comes to like design and stuff like that. So I'm not acting like there's not times when I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. We're doing this. There are definitely <laughs> those times. But I do think as a whole that one of the hearts has always been like, like one of our sayings is for the youth by the youth. And it's like, what the heart is to say, how can I, how can you make life high what it is? And then, I mean, I'll provide like the spiritual oversight to it, but I want you to feel like this is your place and not just my place. Cause I'm 29. I could think of a lot of, a lot of other things that I like to do, but y'all are, y'all, y'all aren't 29. So yeah, um, amen. I do think there's something to be said for that. I think a lot of times in, in the modern age, uh, we're trying to, we talked about this last night, actually, or maybe it was today. I think a lot of times we're trying, the days are really running together. <laughs> I think if we're not careful, we'll, we will try to create a counterfeit ministry than the one we're called to because we'll see other ministries and what they're doing and we'll try to recreate that where we're at. And I was actually, I was talking to Evan who's here and I was talking to Noah the other night. And it's like, what's amazing is when you actually know some people behind the scenes at big ministries and you actually see some of their numbers and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, Instagram can fool you very quickly. Very fast. And you cannot realize that in Angleton, Texas, you have a youth ministry the size of unnamed big church that I will not say right here, right now. Yeah. That is very influential in the world. And it's like, you don't realize that. And so I think part of it is is inviting students in to make where they're at the big time and make it their ministry. Because Mm -hmm. you can make it the big time. You don't have to create, you don't have to create the next elevation or the next hill song. Or, uh, no, I was going to say RP in the trigger. That's terrible. Lord, please, please use those song again. Please. Yes. Thank in you, Jesus Lord. Name. We really do. I thank you for all the ways that it impacted me. Yes. I'm being genuine Absolutely. right now, by the way. Absolutely. And thank you for the way that, it, uh, especially even like Carlin's, how much it encouraged me to get out of my comfort zone and share my faith. So I shouldn't have said what I just said. I was wrong. But uh, trying to create all of these different like churches that it's it's be be your church be yes. who God's called you to be draw near to God and do what He's called you to be don't be a counterfeit church yeah like why would you do that yeah. the, the, the Charlotte North Carolina or New York City or Los Angeles and now I'm fired up in Seattle Come and on. wherever else you're at <laughs> they 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 don't know they don't know how to reach Brazoria County yeah. no. and and when you're trying to reach Brazoria County with with by being the next Big church in, 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 I'm using Charlotte out of a place of respect because they have so much influence. Yes. Like that's a respectful thing. Absolutely. They are doing what they're called to do, but it's not what we're called to do. Right. And so be who God called you to be. And I think us trying to create that, I do think has allowed students to maybe enjoy being a part of it a little bit. Yeah. And the truth is the people you're actually ministering to probably don't even know about those places you're comparing yourself to. And if they do, they legitimately do not care. They are not hoping like, well, I just wish you were more like they do it in Charlotte. You ain't never been to Charlotte. You've never <laughs> been outside of Brazoria County. You know what I'm saying? So and I, Houston for senior dinner. They're like, that's my first time to Houston. The I'm big like, oh, city. 
It's a real story. That actually That's so funny. No, but I think um one of the things that just popped in my head in regards to what you were just saying is something that just happened to you. Um, and that is you're like kind of like nervous. I can see that on your face. No, when you took that long Instagram break, all of a sudden you were like, I'm able to appreciate what God is giving me because I don't have these external influences telling me I need something better. Like she was like, God started providing like furniture for us. And because she was on this massive Instagram break, she's like, I really enjoy this furniture. Yeah, God knew exactly what my taste was. And legitimately, I closed my eyes like to my phone. I put it away. No one else gets to tell me that I should have something more expensive or more luxurious. I'm like, this works so well in our space. He helped us make our like our house a home. And yeah, it just it it made what was influencing me just so Yeah. I mean and I think there's a I think there's a correlation to ministry. A lot of times you're dissatisfied with the move of God right under your nose because you're comparing it to the move of God on your phone. Yeah. And like you're seeing like, well, they're doing this and they're doing that. That's a cure they they you are seeing what that ministry wanted you to see. We want to be advertised like this. And you are, you know, comparing it to what the, you know, ev- what the drapes look like at your church and it's like whatever yeah. you know if you just like sometimes like for real like get off your phone yeah. and, and like you'll love your life again yeah yeah the reason so many leaders don't do what you guys are doing is because they have a counterfeit honor culture can we talk a counterfeit <laughs> honor culture yeah. and i'm not gonna let the students close because the second they realize i have no idea what i'm doing they won't honor me anymore so i have to fake it until i make it i have to act like the man of god all the time and i i think i mean david there was nobody more transparent yeah. than david but david's mighty men w- literally laid their lives down for him there was nobody who was respected more. They saw like there was even mutiny in the air at one point. There was mutiny in the air. And David's like, yo, like all these guys, they're gonna come at me. And you read about it in Psalms, you know, like when um the their entire village got pillaged and stuff like that. And like women were who happened, who knows what happened to him. And they're all the guys are beginning to like turn on David. And David's like having to go to before the Lord. And David was transparent before his men. And, um, you know, there's nothing that like draws the heart. You know, one of the books I love is a tale of three ki- or a tale of two Kings or three Kings. Yes. Is it three? It's three you Kings. Just, you just are, you are about tale to three speak love language. Be careful. When this podcast is over today, yeah. we need to have a sub conversation. I love this. a tale of three Kings. Yeah. So, so good. If you haven't read it, but he talks about like in that book, like almost as if like the, one of David's mighty men is being interviewed as to what it was like to be under him. And there were moments where there was like, yeah, he's just crying off in the court. Like the guy's like describing David, he's just weeping, but there's nobody we respected more. There's nobody we loved more. And like, dude, that's like, that's what I love. And not that you're over in the corner crying all the time. I mean, that, that, that kind of, that kind of is. That counterfeit honor culture where you never, where they never see you bleed. They never see you cry. They never see you quake. They never see you like, God, I don't know what to mm. do. This is awkward, but I'm trying to follow you, Lord. Like it doesn't produce real Christians. I want to touch on something you just said that I think is super important if anyone's watching this that's in ministry. Mm. Yeah. There is a difference between bleeding in front of people and bleeding on people. Absolutely. Wow. So, so for example, I have young adults in this room. <laughs> What a really good, really good. I love how you just like I just love how you just tugged on Evan's heartstrings right there. Wow. <laughs> Come on. Um, there there are young adults in this room that I'm extremely vulnerable with. Yeah. But because I understand the dynamic of what God has called me to do or to be in their lives, I feel like the Holy Spirit draws good boundary yes. lines of you can Absolutely. see me bleed. But I will never bleed on you. And if I need so to good. bleed on someone, I'm bleeding on you. Yep. Right? Yep. Like if I need to bleed on someone, not you know. <laughs> let it, maybe we need to rephrase that. I <laughs> no, I'm going good. to. It was I good. will. I will process through things with my my first most peer and yes. the, the my authority figures in a way that is different than how I will process through that thing For with sure. somebody. Yep. That I am in 
a different dynamic of yeah. a relationship with. I think in sometimes trying to be vulnerable and trying to be transparent, we end up vomiting on the people that we're supposed to be leading. And instead of giving them an example of healthy processing, mm-hmm. we cause chaos and confusion. Yes. And I think it's extremely important to exercise discernment and wisdom in vulnerability and transparency. We don't want to swing w- one way and shut down and not be vulnerable and not be transparent. Yes. That's not how Jesus did ministry. But we also know when it's something that I need to take to the Father, when it's something I need to take to somebody who can walk through this with me versus how much of this am I going to allow somebody to see into because it's going to bring health and healing for them. So good. And, um, okay, I want to say one more thing. I'm sorry. I don't. This is going to be a rough transition, but I've been trying to fit it in so i'm gonna fit in right here that was really good and i agree with you um and sometimes the best thing to do even when it feels good to talk about something with other people and you're really just venting is just keep your mouth shut Mm -hmm. move on all right so now transitioning into this other part (laughs) when you were talking about the furniture this light bulb went off for me and it was this light bulb going back to kind of even what we were talking about at the beginning of comparison comparing ourselves to other people or comparing comparing ourselves in a bad way. I think there's good comparison in the sense of like we compare ourselves and it can inspire us to for, to reach for more. But compar- comparison that really is envy or jealousy, mm-hmm. that type of comparison. Think about people that buy counterfeits. Mm-hmm. People that buy counterfeits are envious of people that have something that they can't possess. So good. Right? So it's like, comparison it can be at the root of these of of these counterfeits that we purchase and i think that i think that it causes us to live in to live out lies and when we live out lies there's there's no other there's no place that we get stuck more than when we are living the lies yes because truth so true. sets free. free so so the so the reality is is like is is checking even just ridding ourselves, being very intentional to try to rid ourselves of envy and jealousy. I don't want to use the word comparison because I think that's that's not a good enough word right now. It does fit with the C's though. So that's good for that. Yeah, so we use it, but when I say it, I'm talking about no. But envy and jealousy, envy and jealousy, because envy and jealousy cause us to be led by it causes us to be led by a lie. And the lie is, is if I was there, then I would be complete. Yeah. And and but then when you got there, you wouldn't be complete because you'd have something new to envy. And completeness only comes when you have identity and, and confidence in Christ. And identity and confidence can only be found in Christ when you're secure and you don't have anything else to be envy of because you can enjoy his presence. And his presence can wash you with the water and the word and give you a weapon for the life that you have to live. And that applies in ministry. That applies in being a young adult. That applies in owning a business. That implies in, in raising children. That implies yeah. in leading a family. That applies in all of it. When we start getting led by envy, we purchase counterfeits and everyone around us can tell it's a counterfeit. It's cheap. Yeah. It's falling apart. It's yeah. got, it's got, it's got, it, Jerry Lorenzo was going to, he stitched those things up nice, but it was, it was super glued in China and yeah. that super glue is falling off. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody can tell. Uh-huh. And it's like, buddy, can you please take those back to the original creator? Yes. And here's the, here's the thing too is, okay. All right. I don't know how far I want to get into this. I'm sorry. But don't apologize. I, like watches, they make a lot of counterfeit watches. And a counterfeit watch, it when when they make it, like some of the, especially dive watches will have how much how deep you can dive on that watch. A counterfeit watch will have that same specification on it. But if you take it deeper than it was intended to go because it was made by a different creator even though it says you can go that far you'll get you will break and get burnt out when you try to go that far because you're not able to because it's a this is good and okay. it looks the same but it ain't the same right <laughs> it's out it's out of oil and i see the camera sizzling and when we envy, so good. when we envy other people we are able to we are able to manufacture a life that looks like we have biblical faith but when we get pushed to places that are beyond, that are, that are places that break us and burn us out, watch this. You don't have to feel condemnation for it. 
It's a great invitation and opportunity not to get stuck there, but to get up because it reveals within you the reality that you were believing and trusting in a counterfeit and you weren't following the Lord. You were following Come on. and you weren't following the Lord. And so trade, trade in the counterfeit, get the real deal because the real deal will take you to depths that you can, that you're actually supposed to go to. Let's go. You watch this whole podcast just for that. Come on. And the crowd goes, wow. And get sets free and get set free. No, that was literally fire. So, so good. And I am stealing that analogy. <laughs> I am totally stealing that. I don't know how I didn't know about that. That was so good. But guys, th I think that is like a beautiful place for us to wind down because I think it really does bring us full circle to what we began talking about is the getting stuck. And when you have a counterfeit watch like that, you're going to get stuck before you get to the where it's promised you you're going to yeah. go. And so many people, you are only stuck because you have dabbled in the counterfeit. You are only stuck because you have chosen to live inside of a limitation. The word of God is ready to break off of you. And so Grant, I think the only appropriate way to end this is just to have you pray over people and uh, just pray those limitations off of them. Pray that the 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 light of the word of God would be illuminated in their hearts to see the lies for what they are. Um, yeah, I'd love if you just pray over people. Let's do it. Let's pray. And let's think about this as we go into prayer, that a counterfeit will ultimately end up costing you more money too. It's cheap at the beginning, but it costs you more money over time. And the lie that the enemy causes us to, to stay trapped is this lie that if you try to get up and go, it's going to cost you so much. People are going to make fun of you. People are going to say, that's not who you are. It's going to be awkward. It's going to be weird. But the reality is, is that it will have a cost at the beginning, but it, it will set you free and it will be so much better for your life over the long run. That counterfeit thing, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Then you have to get another counterfeit and another counterfeit. It's going to keep on costing you. So I want to pray so that, good. I want to pray that that revelation would click in your brain, yeah. that, that you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to fear getting up and changing and even what people's response or opinions will be to that. So Father, I just thank you so much for every single person in this room and every single person watching this, Lord. And what I'm asking you for right now is I'm asking you that any counterfeit that we have been following, that Lord, you would reveal it to us. And God, right now I'm even asking that you would reveal to us areas where we've been broken and burnt out. Mm -hmm. And we, we're just like, we're wondering, how am I broken and burnt out? The specifications, I, I've, I've had the confession of faith. It said it was, it said it was going to work out like this, but it's not. And the reality is, is that it's because we weren't following, uh, we weren't being consecrated and following conviction. We were really following these counterfeits, Lord. And I just pray that, that you would reveal to us in this moment the things in our life that have broken us and caused us to be burned out. Yes, Lord. And that have that that the the that the starting place of that was that we stepped out and we followed a story or a narrative that was not your story or your narrative, Lord. It wasn't your story, it wasn't your narrative, and we began to follow it. And we began to get wrapped up in it, and it became an idol. And that idol has led us to bondage and break breaking and burnout. And I'm asking you that right now you would set us free. Mm -hmm. And it would, we would be set free because we would be able to see that, God, you are inviting us, like, like you are reaching out your hand to Peter right now in the water. You are standing over the tax collector booth with Matthew. You are down in the dirt with the woman caught in the act of adultery. And wherever we're at right now, you're looking at us and you are saying, come on, get up and come and follow me. Yes. I have a better way for your life. I have a better word to speak over you. And I thank you for setting people free, Jesus. You're so good. We thank you. We worship you. We're grateful for you. We just enjoy you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Spirit of God, move in a way that only you can move across the world on these cameras and in this room right now. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this episode. We'll see you on the next one.